Hi guys, Dane here, Sick Dane, and uh, today I'm going to be making a start of my review of Superior, The Return of Race Science by Angela Saini. So I started reading this bad boy on the exercise bike at the gym today, I'm what, a third of the way through it maybe, and um, yeah, I'm going to read the blurb, I'm going to check out some of my uh, tabs as we go, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end, so. Dane reads. Where did the idea of race come from, and what does it mean? In an age of identity politics, DNA ancestry testing and the rise of the far right, a belief in biological differences between populations is experiencing a resurgence. The truth is, race is a social construct. Our problem is we find this hard to believe. In Superior, award-winning author Angela Saini investigates the concept of race from its origins to the present day. Engaging with geneticists, anthropologists, historians and social scientists from across the globe, Superior is a rigorous, much needed examination of the insidious and destructive nature of the belief that race is real and that some groups of people are superior to others. So yes, it's kind of an anti-racist book I suppose. And we start with a prologue with this quote here from Fundamental English Breakfast. He says, In the British Museum is where you can see them, the bones of African human beings. Which is very true. There's that old joke of why are the pyramids in Egypt because they were too heavy to move them to the British Museum. Um, and Saini writes, no single item in the museum is more important than the museum itself. All these jewels brought together like this have an obvious tale to tell, one constructed to remind us of Britain's place in the world. It's a testament to the audacity of power, which is a great line, a testament to the audacity of power. And so she kind of delves deeper into the British Museum and I think this is worth reading. The ancient Egypt galleries of the British Museum are always the most crowded. As we walk past the ancient mummies in their glittering cases, we don't always recognise that this is also a mausoleum. We're surrounded by the skeletons of real people who lived in a civilization no less remarkable than the ones that followed or that went before. Every society that happens to be dominant comes to think of itself as being the best deep down. The more powerful we become, the more our power begins to be framed as not only cultural but natural. We portray our enemies as ugly foreigners and our subordinates as inferior. We invent hierarchies, give meaning to our own categories. One day, a thousand years forward, in another museum, in another nation, these could be European bones encased in glass, what was once considered an advanced society replaced by a new one. A hundred years is nothing. Everything can change within a millennium. No regional people has a claim on superiority. So a guy uh, here, Wolpuff, I can't see his first name, uh, I'd have to flick back through, but he talks about how the idea of race in itself is kind of irrelevant. Um, a race in biology is a subspecies, Wolpoff clarifies when I ask him about it. It's a part of a species that lives in its own geographic area, that has its own anatomy, and can integrate with other subspecies at the boundaries. There are no subspecies anymore. There may have been subspecies in the past, that's something we argue about, but we do know that there are no subspecies now. And this is some interesting stuff about Neanderthals, um, because we used to, you know, Neanderthal was considered an insult, but we've kind of reframed what it means because we found that maybe white people are closer to Neanderthals than we thought. For more than a century, the word Neanderthal had been synonymous with low intelligence. In the space of a decade, once the genetic link to modern Europeans was suspected and then confirmed, that all changed. In the popular press, there was a flurry of excitement about our hitherto undervalued relatives. Headlines proclaimed that we haven't been giving Neanderthals enough credit, popular science, that they were too smart for their own good, Telegraph, that humans didn't outsmart the Neanderthals, Washington Post. Meanwhile, a piece in the New Yorker whimsically reflected on their apparent everyday similarity to humans, including the finding that they may have suffered from psoriasis. Poor things, they even itched like us. With each new discovery, the distance between them and us seems to narrow, wrote the author. In the popular imagination, the family tree had gained a new member. In January 2017, the New York Times asked, Neanderthals were people too, why did science get them so wrong? This was indeed the big question. If the definition of people had always included archaic humans, then why should Neanderthals so suddenly be accepted as people now? And not just accepted, but elevated to the celebrity status of sadly deceased genius cousin. It wasn't so long ago that scientists had been reluctant to accept the full humanity even of Aboriginal Australians. Gail Beck's family had been denied their culture, trapped in their own nation as unworthy of survival, their children ripped from them to be abused by strangers. In the 19th century, they had been lumped together with Neanderthals as evolutionary dead ends, both destined for extinction. But now that kinship had been established between the Europeans and Neanderthals, now we were all people, now we had found our common ground. 
If it had turned out that Aboriginal Australians were the ones to possess that tiny bit of Neanderthal ancestry instead of Europeans, would our Neanderthal cousins have found themselves quite so remarkably reformed? Would they have been welcomed warmly with such tight hugs? It's hard not to see in the public and scientific acceptance of Neanderthals as people like us, another manifestation of the Enlightenment habit of casting humanity in the European image. In this case, Neanderthals have been drawn into the circle of humankind by virtue of being just a little related to Europeans, forgetting that a century ago it was their supposed resemblance to indigenous Australians that helped cast actual living human beings out of the circle. And she quotes a guy she spoke to called John Shea, uh, who said, You can either use the present to explain the past, or you can use the past to explain the present, but you can't do both. Uh, and she heads off to uh, Paris in chapter two. It's a small world, which just interested me because I've just got back from Paris. I'm actually, that's, I think, where I picked up the bug, which is the reason why I'm currently ill and my voice sounds like garbage. And here we, get, we learn about the origins of race. Um, some of the first known uses of the word date from as recently as the 16th century, but not in the way we use it now. Instead, at that time it referred to a group of people from common stock, like a family, a tribe, or perhaps, at a long stretch, a small nation. Even until the European Enlightenment in the 18th century, many still thought about physical difference as a permeable, shifting quantity. It was rooted in geography, perhaps explaining why people in hotter regions had darker skins. If those same people happened to move somewhere colder, it was assumed their skins would automatically lighten. A person could shift their identity by moving place or converting to another religion. The notion that race was hard and fixed, a feature that people couldn't choose, an essence passed down to their children, came slowly and in large part from Enlightenment science. 18th century Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus, famous for classifying the natural world from the tiniest insects to the biggest beasts, turned his eye to humans. If flowers could be sorted by colour and shape, then perhaps we too could fall into groups. In the 10th edition of Systema Naturae, a catalogue published in 1758, he laid out the categories we still use today. He listed four main flavours of human, respectively corresponding to the Americas, Europe, Asia and Africa, and each easy to spot by their colours, red, white, yellow and black. And she talks about human zoos. Um, and she points out, um, by the time human zoos were a popular attraction, when the ghostly enclosures of the Bois de Vincennes were not eerily empty as they are now, but full of performers, when I would have more likely been within a cage than outside it, the parameters of human difference have become hardened into what we recognize them as today. And just that thought, I mean, it's true, but it's awful, isn't it? The thought that she would be more likely to be in the cage than outside them. And this is just crazy. Um, Propelled by a belief that black people had their own unique diseases, Samuel Cartwright, a medical doctor practicing in Louisiana and Mississippi, characterized in 1851 what he saw as a mental condition particular to black slaves, coining it drapetomania, or the disease causing Negroes to run away. Harvard University historian Evelyn Hammonds, who teaches Cartwright's story to her students, laughs darkly when she recounts it. It makes sense to him, because if the natural state of the Negro is to be a slave, then running away is going against their natural state, and therefore it's a disease. I learned that Darwin was born on the same day as Abraham Lincoln. And here's her conclusion from this chapter, which I think is quite powerful. She says, As I stand among the weeds and crumbling former homes of Paris's human zoo, it's difficult to avoid concluding that the reason anyone pursued the scientific idea of race was not so much to understand the difference in our bodies, but to try to justify why we lead such different lives. Why else? Why would something as superficial as skin colour or body shape matter otherwise? What the scientists really wanted to know was why some people are enslaved and others free, why some prosper while others are poor, and why some civilizations have thrived while others haven't. Imagining themselves to be looking objectively at human variation, they saw answers in our bodies to questions that existed far outside them. Race science had sat always at the intersection of science and politics, of science and economics. Race wasn't just a tool for classifying physical difference, it was a way of measuring human progress, of placing judgment on the capacities and rights of others. And this is interesting, um, she writes, you have biologists who say there is no such thing as race, we need to get over it, forget it, Sabadra Das tells me in an angry whisper. But then, if there is no such thing, why did you just say race? Where did that idea come from? And here we get here, um, uh, who is it, Galton. Uh, Francis Galton. Uh, he drew on the fact that brilliant writers were often related to other brilliant writers. He noted that, that of 605 notable men who lived between 1453 and 1853, one in six were related. The ingredients for greatness must be heritable, he reasoned. Choosing to overlook that being notable might also be a product of connections, privilege and wealth, which these men also had. Yes, that's interesting. <laughs> we learn a little bit about forced sterilization. The hardware behind at least one of America's most ambitious eugenics projects came from none other than IBM, the same company that went on to supply the Nazi regime in Germany with the technology it needed to transport millions of victims to the concentration camps. 
did not know that about IBM. And uh, we learn about the sort of state of things in India. She writes, in India too, European notions of racial superiority were easily absorbed by some, partly because they mirrored the country's existing caste system, itself a kind of racial hierarchy, but also because Germany's Aryan myth placed the noble races having once lived in their region. The ideological quest for the true Aryans remains alive in India, and Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf is a bestseller in Indian bookshops. So Das explains, uh, you'll find photographs of Nazi scientists measuring people's heads, measuring people's noses, matching their eye colour. The eye and hair colour charts reveal just how slippery the dogged mantras of rationality and objectivity can be when it comes to studying human difference. Any scientist who claims that they are not politicised, or that they are asking questions out of pure curiosity, they are lying to themselves, she continues. The structure in itself is fundamentally structurally racist because it has always been taken at its face, never going back and taking apart those underpinnings. What does it matter if one person has black hair and brown eyes? and another has blonde hair and blue eyes. Why not compare heights or weights or some other variable? These particular features matter only because they have political meaning attached to them. And um, this is dark but very true and worrying. It was all so long ago, we imagine that it's well and truly over now. We think of the horrors of the Holocaust and earlier genocides, of slavery and colonialism, of the many millions who were killed, of the twisted logic behind these actions as belonging to another time. We imagine that the end of the Second World War spelled an abrupt end for race science. Eugenics is a dirty word. We're enlightened now. We're wiser. But the story doesn't end quite so quickly. While they may have tempered their politics, race scientists didn't simply disappear after the war. Those who had built their work around eugenics and studying human difference, who staked their careers on it, simply found new avenues. And interesting we learn that what actually helped kill eugenics, uh, it says, what helped kill it in the end wasn't just the war, but also the fact that new research showed it probably wouldn't work. The way we inherit traits from our parents turns out to be more complicated than Galton imagined. There is no guarantee that two beautiful and brilliant parents will produce brilliant and beautiful kids. Genetics is more of a game of chance. The science of inheritance, once it was better understood, didn't support the idea that humans could breed themselves to perfection, whatever perfection meant. Complex psychological traits such as intelligence are not controlled by a few mere genes, and are also heavily influenced by environment and upbringing. Yet it was decades before eugenics policies introduced to other parts of the world were abandoned. Only in 1974 did the American state of Indiana repeal legislation that had made it legal to sterilize those it considered undesirable. Investigations by reporter Corey Johnson in 2013 uncovered that doctors working for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation had continued the practice, sterilizing as many as 150 women inmates between 2006 and 2010, possibly by coercing them into having the procedure. In Japan, a eugenic protection law introduced in 1948 to sterilize those with mental illness and physical disabilities and prevent the birth of inferior offspring was repealed only in 1996. Victims of the legislation are still pushing for justice. Uh, she, find, she comes across uh, in some scientific papers, um, one on the blood groups of the Sainis in parts of Punjab, and she says, a study that may well have included relatives from my father's branch of the family, which makes it all just a bit too close to home, you know? And um, we learn about this guy called Gates. Um, what interests me about it is his incredulity, I'm told by historian Gavin Schaefer. He seemed genuinely surprised. In a sense, he was a man caught out by time. Uh, Francis Galton died in 1911 and Carl Pearson in 1936 before they could witness race science reach its most brutal peak. But others, such as Gates, lived long enough to see the political mood change and then suffer the consequences when their own politics didn't. At every opportunity, Gates refused to budge from his belief in racial superiority and inferiority. Whenever he found himself professionally hindered, he imagined himself to be the victim of some Jewish plot to derail his work. Schaefer recounts one especially bad experience in 1948, when Gates was working briefly at Howard University, this historically black college in Washington, D.C. A petition was got up to remove him because of allegations that he was a racist, which he was. But he was stunned by that, Schaefer says. He articulated his understanding of that as a manifestation of an international Jewish conspiracy, as opposed to just understanding that, in a historically black university, the kind of work that he did and the kind of things that he said were always going to be challenged. Even when he agreed to leave Howard, Gates grumbled in private that only a few ignorant Negroes were fit to be in a university at all. Gates could never accept that the world was moving on, leaving those like him behind. I can't stand that people who were like, their bad behaviour gets called out, and when their bad behaviour gets called out, they say, oh, it's all a conspiracy against me. It's like, no, you just can't behave yourself. Uh, there's a quote by Ashley Montague, uh, who is an American writer and anthropologist who wrote uh, 1942, Man's Most Dangerous Myth, The Fallacy of Race. And he wrote, the word race itself is racist. 
What a race is, no one seems exactly to know, but everyone is most anxious to tell. But uh, it was on the back of work like this that UNESCO in July 1950 released its first statement on race, stressing unity between humans in a concerted effort to eradicate what it saw as the outcome of a fundamentally anti-rational system of thought. It was meant to be the last word on the subject, to flush away racism once and for all. Scientists have reached general agreement in recognising that mankind is one, that all men belong to the same species, Homo sapiens. But unfortunately that was then challenged by the racists and they had to backtrack, which is just ridiculous. We get a reference to Gates again. One reason he pressed on with his commitment to races as meaningful categories, argues Schaefer, is that he sincerely believed his own research was objective and those challenging him were the ones driven by ideology. He saw himself as the bearer of truth held back by an anti-science political agenda that was mistakenly trying to impose racial equality on the world. Who believed it even while he was receiving funding from segregationists in the United States. And that just reminds me so much of what we see happening in the world today, you know? We learn about a guy called Jean Philippe Rushton. He became notorious in academic circles for claiming that brain and genital size are inversely related, making black people better endowed but less intelligent than whites. If that's true, I must be the cleverest man on earth. And we learn about Ralph Scott, a professor of educational psychology at the University of Northern Iowa, who has some dodgy views. And uh, she explains, what turned the story into one of national significance was that in 1985, the Reagan administration appointed Scott the chair of the Iowa Advisory Commission on Civil Rights, a body whose express purpose was the enforcement of anti-discrimination legislation across the state. Just a few years earlier, Scott had brought and later dropped a lawsuit against three black civil rights activists who had described him as a racist. It was clear that even after taking up his influential post, Scott's views on racial difference hadn't changed. He continued to write pieces for the Mankind Quarterly and Pearson's Journal of Social, Political and Economic Studies. Indeed, his most recent article for the Mankind Quarterly was published as recently as 2013. Scott, now an emeritus professor, refuses to give me any comments or to confirm or deny Merler's reports. But William Tucker has noted through his research that almost every one of his papers is a variation on the same theme, that integrated schools are holding black white students and not improving achievement among black students for the simple reason that the two groups are somehow genetically different. So I didn't know this, but this is messed up. Uh, she writes... Um, in 1994, in The Bell Curve, one of the most notorious bestsellers of the 20th century, American political scientist Charles Murray and psychologist Richard Herrnstein suggested that black Americans were less intelligent than whites and Asians. A review at the time in the New York Review of Books observed that they cited five articles from the Mankind Quarterly and no fewer than 17 researchers who had contributed to the journal. Murray and Hernstein went so far as to describe Richard Lynn as a leading scholar of racial and ethnic differences. Although the bell curve was widely panned after its publication, an article in American Behavioral Scientist describing it as fascist ideology, in 2017 Scientific American noted that Charles Murray was enjoying an unfortunate resurgence. Facing down protests, he was being invited to give lectures on college campuses across the United States. So here we have, uh, what's his name, Levin. Da -da -da -da. Michael Levin, a professor of philosophy at the City University of New York. Um, he says, it's no wonder there are very few black scientists. You have to have an IQ of 130 to be a successful research scientist. And this is interesting here. Um Gerhard Meissenberg is being quoted. Without much selectivity and migration, all countries of the world become homogenized, not only in ability level, but also in culture and everything else. Countries become more similar to each other, he writes. How tragic it would be to have the whole world look exactly the same. On a logical level, he fails to explain how, if races are fixed and immutable in the way he thinks they are, we could all end up the same just by migrating. But this isn't the point. On the surface, heard quickly, his concerns sound almost sensible, in the same way that eugenics sounded so rational and attractive to progressive social reformers in the early 20th century. Who back then could argue against the pursuit of a healthier, stronger population? Who today could argue against countries and groups maintaining their distant cultures? Mm, but that's how they get you. We get the idea that it can't be racist if it's a fact, but as we learn in this, facts are twisted. We all know this, we live in a, a false news era, you know? And we get a project um, by a guy called um, Cavalli Sforza. He was looking at um, sequencing the genome of different racial groups to prove that we're not so different after all. Um, they were like all very left wing and all had the best of intentions, but they, uh, they still ended up getting attacked, often by the people who should have been on their side. Um, and Saini puts it really well, she, she explains possibly the problem is with the methodology because they were still uh, approaching it through a lens of racism, uh, just the inherent lens of racism. If they'd have um, been sampling the genomes of just random people, that would have been great, but they did, decided to specifically target individual races, you know. Anyway, 
Cavalli swore so was used to receiving hate mail from people who disagreed with his outspoken belief that genetics didn't support old-fashioned notions of race. In 1973, he had publicly debated with William Shockley, a Stanford University physicist and joint Nobel Prize winner, who in later life became a notorious racist. Shockley believed that black Americans had intellectual shortcomings that were hereditary, and that black women should therefore be voluntarily sterilized. He was among the most prominent race theorists to receive support from the Pioneer Fund. When they met at Stanford, Cavalli Sforza coolly demolished his claims fact by fact. That is the way to do it, isn't it? My voice is going, you can hear it going. And so this here is a bit of a description of how it's hard to break three of that racist way of thinking, even if you're not a racist. Um, they basically redistributed race, argues Joanna Radin. According to her, the problem with this statistical population approach to studying human difference is that even though it may look different in some ways, it hasn't fully discarded the baggage of the past. An interesting analogy would be colonialism, she tells me. A colonial nation declares independence and they have to forge a new nation with the structures of the old colonial regime and it's very, very hard to transcend that. Even if the word race isn't being used, the idea of race is still there deep within the bedrock. And here's some interesting stuff about how important the language we use is, which I think to us wordy folks uh, is very important. It's easy for academics to imagine that the language they use and the frameworks they operate in don't really matter. They're just words, not data. I think that in the real world, what the scientists say has about as much influence as turning on a fan does in El Nino. It's what throwing a cobble into the English Channel has on Atlantic weather, Henry Greeley tells me near the end of our interview. We're just not that important. But it does matter, because their frameworks and language contribute to our understanding of ourselves. If scientists call people of mixed ancestry hybrids, this implies that race is real because we are different enough to warrant using that word. If they talk about isolate, this sounds like there are groups who are more racially pure than others. Dismantling the edifice of race is about more than just tweaking language. It is about fundamentally rewriting the way we think about human difference, to resist the urge to group people at all. It takes some mental acrobatics to be an intellectual racist in the light of the scientific information we have today, but those who want to do it will. Racists will find validation wherever they can, even if it means working a little harder than usual. And this is the reason that good scientists who do reliable research, ones who are also well-intentioned and anti-racist as Cavalli Sforza was, can't afford to be cavalier or leave room for misinterpretation. There's an uncertain space between recognising that there is a gap in knowledge and actually filling that gap. It's a place where speculation thrives, where the racists reside. Racists adopted the same concepts as good scientists and the same language as anti-racists to claim that if some average differences can be seen between certain groups, then by that logic, certain groups might be better on average than others at certain things. When Steve Saylor and his followers talk about human biodiversity, this is what they mean. The wolf in, this wolf in sheep's clothing is 21st century scientific racism. And we learn about like DNA testing and Oprah is linked to Liberia. Um, but it says, uh, this means that if there are few or no DNA samples from people in the country your ancestors came from, you're stuck. One of the reasons Oprah is linked to Liberia, for example, may be that this is where former slaves were long ago repatriated by white American leaders who couldn't bear the thought of such people living freely among them. Ancestry testing doesn't show you your past as much as it reveals the people you are distantly related to in the present, and even then only if they have had similar tests done. Oprah has some connection to people who now live in Liberia, but this is not necessarily her ancestral homeland, the place from which her relatives originally came. And we get, um, a little mention of Morrissey here, which I want to read out. Uh, I consider myself a Morrissey fan, but yeah, he does say some dodgy things. I actually recently read his autobiography as well, so I think that's also relevant to share, you know? When she was growing up, my little sister was a die-hard fan of Morrissey, frontman of the Smiths, genius songwriter, British cultural icon. For one of a handful of brown girls in a white working class southeast London suburb, indie music spoke to that cold, lonely feeling of not quite being able to fit in. If the British National Party was marching outside our door, inside her headphones was a different British voice that she could relate to. He was a refuge from those who insisted that we all had to be the same. But in an interview with a music magazine in 2007, Morrissey said something that couldn't help but trouble my sister, as well as other fans. Whatever England is now, it's not what it was, and it's lamentable that we've lost so much, he complained. He railed against high immigration, against what he saw as a change in the character of Britain. There was public outrage. She lost a hero. But as we and our family knew too well, out in the country as a whole, there were many who felt this way. There was a, this was a debate that had been simmering for decades, occasionally stoked by national politics, making people anxious, wondering what it meant to be British. And we learn about the Cheddar Man, uh, um, an, uh, like a skeleton of an, a man found in, um, in uh, the West Country, uh, and scientists think he had black skin, and that got a lot of racists very angry. Um, 
I mean, it's just skin pigmentation, you know? It's just so trivial, reflects Mark Thomas. He found reaction to the new finding about Cheddar Man Bazaar, given the scientific facts. Obviously, there are some idiot racists over there in the corner for whom it's important. But I think if you base your identity on the pigmentation of some West Country bloke from 10,000 years ago, then you really should rethink it. My own personal view is that today we overprivilege and fetishize the concept of identity. Here we have a guy called Reich. Um, what's his name? David Reich. Um, which is ironic that he's not a racist considering Reich just makes me think of the Third Reich. But anyway... Um, he makes a really good point. He says, while he sees the racists as factually wrong, he also sees some anti-racists, those who insist that we are all exactly the same underneath, as not having the full facts either. It's a little bit painful to see very well-meaning people saying things that are contradicted by the science, because we want well-meaning people to say things that are correct, he tells me. The way I see what's going on in this world right now, there are racist people that are just perpetrating falsehoods and just representing the science in incorrect ways, tendentious ways in order to achieve certain goals. And then there's people whose perspective on the world I agree with who are actually saying things that are technically incorrect. And we uh, get a reference to all those weird History Channel documentaries that claim that, you know, various races are descended from aliens or whatever. So here we're talking about uh, Native Americans. Um, in the shock of uncovering complex ancient civilizations in the New World, the first Europeans imagined elaborate ways in which they could have got there. It's so interesting to me when I look at ideas, alternative ideas to explain the archaeology, Raf continues. The Solutrian hypothesis, she says, is just the latest iteration. People are so desperate to find a non-mainstream answer to a lot of these issues. They won't just invoke Europeans, they'll invoke aliens, they'll invoke people from Atlantis, whatever they can find as long as it's not Native Americans. When the Book of Mormon was published in 1830, it claimed that Native Americans were descendants of the lost tribes of Israel who migrated to the Americas around 600 BCE and had been cursed with a dark skin for slaughtering their righteous relatives. So I think this is quite prescient and quite fitting to today's society. Underlying assumptions and ideas definitely get embedded in ways that we don't even think about consciously, which can play out in the science, Bolnick adds. We interpret data, we bring our perspectives, our framings to the data. You can use the same data to say many different things. I think modern genomic data provides the perfect example of that, because you can have different people who are all very smart and understand the data, who look at the same data sets and describe them in polar opposite directions. It's impossible to escape our beliefs, our upbringing, our environment, even the pressure of wanting to be correct when it comes to interpreting the facts. Our stories get in the way. And then, um, this is some sort of scary reflection of how um, politics can influence science and vice versa. Um, in the first two years after Adolf Hitler came to power, eight new academic chairs in German prehistory were created. History was deliberately rewritten and appropriated by the party. The infamous swastika we associate with the Third Reich was employed after German archaeologists found the same prehistoric symbol on old German pottery. The SS double lightning bolt that featured on Nazi uniforms was similarly adapted from an old Germanic rune. And this is just weird, but also makes me proud to be vegan. In 2018, the New York Times reported that white nationalists had been seen chugging milk at gatherings to demonstrate a genetic adaptation shared by many Europeans that allows adults to digest milk, a trait incidentally common to many non-white populations too, who have historically also kept dairy cattle. And this makes a good point as well, that to be a racist you almost have to not be content with the person you are. Um, the nationalists must turn to the past for reassurance, the past is their problem. But then arguably, so it is for all of us in smaller and bigger ways. When we study our genetic ancestry, aren't we also looking for clues about who we are, trying to reaffirm a story we have of ourselves? Why does it matter to some people that their ancestors were Vikings or Egyptian pharaohs? Does being related to Genghis Khan or Edward III make one person living today any different from the next? When we claim ethnic or racial pride, what are we doing but trying to piggyback on the achievements of those who went before? Us. It's not enough to be who we are now, to be good human beings in the present. The power of nationalism is that it calls to the part of us that doesn't want to accept being ordinary. It tells people that they are descended from greatness, that they have been genetically endowed with something special, something passed down to them over the generations. It attaches them to origin stories that have existed for hundreds of years, soaking into their subconscious, obscuring truth with the dazzling light of myth and legend. They are stories that shape even the convictions of world famous geneticists like James Watson, who despite everything he has learned through science clings to the belief that certain groups of people are simply born superior to the rest. And here we learn some about some experiments that have been carried out um, to look at twins to see whether, you know, things like intelligence, whether it's inherited or whether it's a product of the environment. If half of our intelligence can be decided by our genes, then a large part of academic achievement may well be innate, immutable. 
There are important caveats, however. First, measurement of intelligence is itself fraud. Nobody fully satisfied that any IQ test can really do the job, or for that matter, the researchers have pinned down what intelligence really is and whether it can even be captured by a test. Theories about intelligence tend to be culturally loaded. Second, rates of heritability aren't the same for everyone. They depend critically on the environments of the people you're studying. Take a packet of seeds and shake half of them into a container filled with nutrient-rich soil, blessed with all the water and sunshine they need. Take the other half and put them in a container of poor soil with little water and light. In both pots, individual plants will grow to various heights, some taller, some smaller. The differences you see within each pot are largely hereditary because their conditions are the same. But in the first pot, each seed has been given the full opportunity to achieve its potential. In the second, they haven't been, so the plants will inevitably look smaller and scrappier. In this second pot, even the naturally strongest seed may not reach the same height as many of the plants in the more fortunate container. So the differences between the pots are not attributable to heredity. This is interesting as well, just a random fact that I did not know. Uh, psychologists know that if you have an identical twin who's been divorced, you're more likely to be divorced yourself. But uh, Saini points out, this doesn't mean that there's a gene for divorce. And here we get some further evidence that it, it seems to be our environment that it affects people. Um, and a contrast between the US and the UK, which is true. I mean, uh, I am consider myself a white working class boy, um, but I got pretty good GCSEs, but anyway. The United States is also a special case. What's interesting is how the debate over racial differences in IQ takes on a different flavour in other countries. In the United Kingdom, the group that achieves the lowest grades at GCSE level is white working class boys, followed by white working class girls. Scientists haven't jumped to claim that low intelligence is rooted in whiteness. There's no evidence that being white in the UK is a socially disadvantaging factor either, so by this logic it must be their socio-economic status that's the problem. In the decade to 2016, some of the greatest progress in educational attainment was seen among Bangladeshi, black African and Chinese peoples. Girls have also historically tended to outperform boys, even though there is no average intelligence gap between the sexes. According to the founder of the Sutton Trust, which researches social mobility, it's clear that culture is at play here. There are social influences where class, ethnicity and gender intersect, and they all affect achievement. And we learn some disturbing stuff about Albert Einstein. Um, so she writes, the freshly unearthed travel diaries of Albert Einstein, written around 1922, have revealed that even he formed generalizations as he told the world, despite being an anti-racist humanitarian. He described the Chinese as an industrious, filthy, obtuse people, adding, it would be a pity if these Chinese supplant all other races. And this is messed up as well. Um, just some stuff about how uh, mortality is affected by uh, race. Preventable heart disease and stroke resulting from high blood pressure are two to three times more likely to kill a black American than a white American. This mirrors death rates from other causes. The life expectancy of a black person born in the United States today is three and a half years lower than that of a white person. Almost every major cause of death and disability, even, infant, even infant mortality, hits blacks harder if they live in the United States. And further crazy information as well, this whole book is just a mindfuck from start to finish. Uh, she writes, what is clear is that researchers are nowhere near understanding all the impacts of the social factors relating to health. One 2018 study even found a possible relationship between racism in a geographical area and the health of newborns in that area. Researchers saw, astonishingly, a direct correlation between the proportion of Google searches for the N-word in the area and the prevalence of black babies born prematurely or with a low birth weight. They noticed a similar heightened birth risk among women with Arab surnames in the six months after the 9-11 attack. And uh, this bit was called some stuff on personalized medicine. I've uh, worked with a client to write, write a quite a bit actually uh, about personalized healthcare and this kind of puts it pretty well, the, the def definition of it. Uh, in reality, those working in medical research know that race is hard to define, that it is a poor proxy for how human variation really works. But when there are a few easy ways to distinguish people, it can feel as good as any. The ultimate aim for many in the medical profession is not to have racialized medicine, but personalized medicine. To be able to sequence an individual's genome and then tailor therapies to suit that individual. With personalized medicine, in principle, nobody will ever need to take a drug that doesn't work on them or that gives them a bad reaction. But sequencing everyone's individual genome is expensive and ethically fraught, and we don't yet have all the data we need to analyse the results. Given these limitations, grouping people by race is seen as an imperfect but practical approximation. Most doctors and medical researchers will admit that it's a fudge, but they use it anyway. A proxy can save money and time after all. Uh, this is awful as well. 
Knowing that there are small average population level differences in disease frequency, therefore, can be misleading when it comes to everyday treatment. Indeed, relying on those averages for guidance can even be life-threatening. American pediatrician Richard Garcia once described the case of a friend who, as a child, repeatedly failed to receive a correct diagnosis for cystic fibrosis because it was thought to be a white disease and she was black. Only when a passing radiologist happened to spot her chest x-ray, without knowing to whom it belonged, was her condition instantly spotted. She had to wait until she was 8 years old and her colour had to be invisible before she could be diagnosed. Imagine that, that's ridiculous. And it was so obvious and as soon as they saw the x-ray, they just had to not know that she was black. And I've heard of, um, of like various biases. I hadn't heard of wish bias, but it makes sense. Uh, so we get, people get trained in schools to build models and make adjustments. This is the way we do things. And then they just apply it to race as though it's the same as a pill you would take. It's completely bizarre, warns Kaufman. Most practitioners in medical research with medical degrees and basic science degrees don't really have much background in statistics. Many people with perfectly good intentions end up committing a lot of statistical errors because of lack of training. And something we call wish bias, which is this idea that you want to find something interesting so you keep sifting through the data and fishing around until you find something interesting. That's a practice that generates many incorrect findings. So all in all, Superior, The Return of Race Science by Angela Saini. As you can tell from how much I've quoted from it, I absolutely love this book. Probably a 4.5 out of 5, one of her best. Um, it's hard to pick a favourite really. I think my favourite of hers might be The Patriarch's favourite used loosely because it is very depressing sometimes to read it, but it, it, you know, she writes the truth, she confronts the things that we need to confront as a society. This is the kind of book that I think if you consider yourself not a racist, you should probably read it to understand why you believe what you believe and how even with the best intentions you can still go astray. So there we go, Superior, The Return of Race Science by Angela Saini. As always, I'd love to hear what you think, so let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.